Welcome to this four-part webinar on levelling up in the era of COVID-19. I'm Matt Ross, Editorial Director of the Publishing House Global Government Forum. Um, as that name suggests, most of what we do is about connecting civil servants across national boundaries. Um, but on this occasion, we're spanning two different sets of borders. Those between UK departments, all of whom will have to do play an active role if we're to improve outcomes and uh, incomes outside London and the South East, and those between the civil service and the wider public sector. Um, I've not met anyone who thinks it's possible for London to single-handedly level up other parts of the country. Uh, so to raise productivity and well-being in these areas, Whitehall departments will have to work in partnership with colleagues at the regional and local levels. Um, so today we're bringing those levels together with topical experts and serving and former civil servants in four panel discussions uh, addressing some of the key issues uh, facing the levelling up agenda. The later sessions will examine the concrete policies that have been set out so far. Um, there's two really, the ambition to move civil servants out of London, the South East, and the renewed commitment to infrastructure investment that we saw in the budget. And they'll consider the role of combined authorities in delivery. Uh, but this first session, we're going to be looking at some of the big strategic questions. What, what does levelling up mean? What's the, how do we define it? Um, how is COVID-19 affecting areas outside the South East, um, perhaps differently from London and the South East? What new challenges does it create? Um, might, in time, the economic and social changes that it's creating provide those regions with any relative advantages? Um, how should it be coordinated and driven within government? And how should departments work with the wider public sector to develop policy and manage delivery? Um, all four sessions will begin with short presentations from the panelists and then we'll move on to questions. Uh, so if you, the audience, have any questions for our panel, then please um, go to the Q&A button, which you'll see at the foot of the Zoom window. Just click on that and type in your questions. I will keep an eye on that and we will save plenty of questions, um, plenty of time for questions after the short comments from the panelists. Um, before going any further, I want to thank our knowledge partner, the Centre for Public Impact. That's a not-for-profit founded by consultancy BCG that works with public servants to reimagine government. And I want to apologise for the bird song and any noise of children you hear. Uh, it's too hot to sit in this wooden cabin uh, with the windows shut, so uh, the bird song it is. Um, to the panel, I'll just talk through who we've got. Um, you can see them there, Philip Rycroft, um, a former Permanent Secretary of the Department for Exiting the European Union, and before that, Second Permanent Secretary uh, in the Cabinet Office with responsibility for constitutional and devolution issues. Tim Pitt, former Special Advisor in the Cabinet Office, Ministry of Justice and Treasury. Uh, Katie Rose, a Programme Manager at the Centre for Public Impact. Chris Murray, Director of the Core Cities Group, which represents 11 major cities around the UK and Dr Nicola Headlam, uh, an expert in regeneration and economic development and a former head of Northern Powerhouse in the Business Department. So we'll hear from each of them now. Philip, do you want to go first? Thanks, Matt. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so in addition to doing those roles in Whitehall, uh, looking after constitution devolution, which I actually carried on doing while I was working at Dexu, my background is actually as a, a civil servant working for successively the Scottish office, Scottish executive and Scottish government. So as we come at this um, from a perspective of, of having worked in devolved uh, government for some time. Um, currently, uh, just worth mentioning, a visiting fellow at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, where this sort of stuff is sort of germane to their work, as well as being a specialist partner at Flint Global. Um, so levelling up near of COVID, um, if I do want to take a sort of fairly strategic overview of the whole question of levelling up, because a language might be new, but there's nothing new about the attempt to level up. And the differential in growth rates across English regions has been a preoccupation for UK governments for decades. And self-evidently, the previous efforts haven't succeeded or we wouldn't be talking about it in the way we are doing today. And the gap between London and the South East 
and other English regions, rather than decreasing over time, has increased. So just one number to throw at you. Between 2006 and, and 2016, London was the only region uh, of the UK to improve its position relative to the UK average. So the question of how uh, the government uh, will approach this uh, it, it, it's a long-standing problem. Uh, from what we can see so far, all the signs are that it's going to seek to manage it as previous governments have um, through policies driven from the centre where the various local actors become largely uh, delivery vehicles for central initiatives. And those, the way that that's been managed over time has chopped and changed over the years, just to remind you, creation of the metropolitan counties in 1972, abolished by Thatcher in 1986, not replaced by very much until new Labour come along and put in place the regional development agencies, uh, which they were essentially administrative vehicles with boards largely appointed by central government and with no clear identity with the ge geographies they covered. Um, the RDAs clearly didn't become very entrenched, as one of the first things the coalition government what it did was to sweep them away and to replace them uh, initially with the local enterprise partnerships, rather incohate um, program uh, to cover uh, local economic development. Uh, at least the LEPs had some sort of relationship to local geography, but of course far less power and influence than the RDAs. And only slowly has something emerged a greater scale from that through the creation of Metro Mayors and the Northern Powerhouse. And I think there is an interesting question mark about the motives um, for George Osborne in pushing the Northern uh, Powerhouse agenda. Clearly there was a recognition at the time of the need to revive uh, Conservative Party fortunes in the North. But one suspects also there's a convenient way of devolving responsibility for implementation of austerity uh, without necessarily devolving real power and resource. So what we have at the moment, I think not to put too fine a point on it, the governance of England is a bit of a mess. And there's no indication that the current government will take a more strategic approach. And I think we can see in the handling of COVID um, and the engagement or lack of engagement of Metro Mayors and the Mayor of London, and to some extent also the devolved governments at critical stages uh, of the COVID-19 planning process is perhaps indicative of the centralised instincts of this government. So I think the question, and a good framing question for those working on this, is will centrally driven policies be any more successful under this government than under previous governments? And my provocation uh, is uh, to ask whether it's perhaps time to see whether the regions of, uh, of England uh, can do more of this for themselves. Having tried everything else, um, how about trying some proper budgetary and policy devolution. Now, in my view, the structures that are emerging through Metro Mayors do cohere with some recognisable uh, local geographies, but Metro Mayors have very limited ability to raise their own resources. Um, England is a real outlier internationally in terms of the proportion of resource that's uh, raised at a local level. Uh, I, I think my latest numbers I've seen, I think we're probably around 5% uh, uh, or so compared in, in most, certainly most federal polities, you're looking at, at very much higher numbers than that, up to 30, 40%. And the ability of Metro Mayors to actually make policy as opposed to implement policy from the South is also limited. So my question, to get sustainable levelling up over time, um, uh, that is not subject to the constant chopping and changing of regional policy made in Whitehall, how about serious devolution in England? So one final thought on this. I absolutely recognise that polling, social attitude polling over the years, uh, as well as the experience of the North East Assembly referendum back in the New Labour days, shows that the idea of regional assemblies is not popular in the abstract with English opinion. But the experience of both Wales and London would show that once established, serious assemblies with real power, as in the case of Wales, and at least influence and some power in the case of London, do grow in public esteem. And given what the politics of the last few years have demonstrated about the sense of political disenfranchisement 
in much of England, particularly in the North and Midlands, perhaps a more devolved policy might address that sense of a democratic deficit, as well as support more locally grounded economic uh, development policies uh, to contribute to the levelling up agenda. So a little bit of a provocation to get us going, but I hope you found that interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. That's great, yeah. Um, we'll do straight on to Tim, eh? Thanks, Matt. Um, so as a, as a former special advisor, I thought I'd, I'd focus my time on, on the politics of levelling up uh, because they're obviously central to this uh, uh, agenda. And I want to talk about three angles to the politics, where, where the levelling up agenda came from, how the COVID crisis may impact it, and then what this all might mean for policy. So first on its origins, as, as Philip said, regional inequality is, is not a new problem. So why has it suddenly risen up the uh, political uh, uh, agenda? And the simple truth is that it comes from the political shifts that have occurred in the UK over the last few years, and, and in particular by the political situation that confronted Boris Johnson when he became Prime Minister last summer. So from, from the word go, the operation around the PM was in, was in complete campaign mode. They, they hoped they'd be able to get a Brexit breakthrough Parliament, but they knew there was a high chance they would need an election to break that deadlock. And they knew that if that election happened, they were going to have to win those leave voting Labour constituencies we hear so much about, you know, in the North, Midlands, North Wales, that in many cases hadn't elected a Tory MP in decades. So, so with these seats firmly in his sights on, on coming into office, the, the PM quickly talked, began talking about levelling up opportunity across the whole country. And this was followed by a complete barrage of high profile spending commitments across a whole range of stuff, but designed primarily to make headlines and to win a general election. And, 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 and in particular, to target those swing voters in Tory Labour marginal seats who wanted to see uh, a, a significant increase in, in, in public spending. Now, policy is always driven by politics to, 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 to some degree, but it was particularly true in those months before the election. And, and, and the result is that you've got a Conservative manifesto with a whole series of policies vaguely connected to levelling up, whether that's increased infrastructure spending, R&D spending, more police, more money for the NHS. But, but it's not a coherent, overarching strategy to tackle regional imbalances. And that's not to be critical of the current government at all. You know, Thatcher and Blair, for example, they came in with big reforming agendas, but they'd had years in opposition to work up what that strategy would look like. For the PM and his team, they didn't have that luxury. They came in at pretty short notice. And ultimately, they did identify a problem, regional inequality, that I think lots of us think is overdue political focus and, and does need tackling. But, but the crucial point, I think, is, is that so far we've had politically motivated policies driving this agenda. And, and what we now need to do is step back and come up with a coherent long-term strategy to tackle, regional, to tackle regional inequality, founded on an evidence-based assessment of what is driving it and what policies are most likely to reduce it, rather than what is going to poll successfully and be popular with voters in, in the short term. Now, the, the complicating factor to that is the second point uh, I want to make, which is around the impact that COVID has had on the economic and political context. So for the foreseeable future, all the focus will be on the recovery and particularly on unemployment, which you know, politically and economically is, is the biggest concern. Now, we don't know how bad that increase will be, and we won't know how bad that increase will be until uh, the job retention scheme unwinds over the next few months. But it seems pretty likely that it will rise significantly. And, and as a result, I think a big part of the levelling up agenda will now be around jobs and be around employment in a way that obviously I don't think it was so much pre-crisis. I think there's also then a question about COVID's impact on existing regional inequalities. Lots of people seem to think that the crisis will exacerbate them. My, my, my own view is that, is that it's probably too early to tell, but the real story may also be at, a, at a quite a local level rather than a, rather than a regional level. So on the employment side, for example, the early data suggests the regional impact may be actually quite evenly spread because some of the hardest hit sectors, uh, retail, hospitality and leisure, are quite evenly geographically distributed. But of course, some of those sectors, some, some badly hit sectors are focused in very particular local areas as well. Think about tourism, for example, and, and the impact that it's going to have on, on coastal towns. And so I think that the crisis will push political attention quite specifically on those hardest hit areas. That's, you know, and, and in terms of what that means for levelling up, it doesn't mean the focus won't be there on those red wall areas anymore. I think absolutely it will be. 
but it won't be the whole story anymore when it comes to, to, to America. And then the kind of the third and final point I wanted to make on what, what does this new political situation mean for policy? And I think that the real challenge is going to be meeting the political need to show tangible progress by the time of the next election in 2024, while, while, while keeping a clear eye on the long-term picture, because you know, as Philip said, tackling regional inequalities is, is a kind of long-term uh, game. It is not something you can fix in a, in, a, in, a, in a single parliament. And in terms of specific policy areas, I'll just very briefly cut, touch on, on two. One, the first is that I think one of the weaknesses of, of, of what we've heard about levelling up so far, and, and partly this is driven by the fact that the fiscal rules, as currently set up, only allow you to borrow to invest uh, uh, and, and not for day-to-day -day spending, it means that there hasn't, there's been a big focus on uplift in, in, in infrastructure, there hasn't been enough focus on human capital. And yet most people would say that's, that's going to have to be a really big part of, of, of regional growth. And I think the big uplift in unemployment will mean much more focus on, on human capital, which is, which is potentially a, a, a good thing. The, the challenge will be ensuring that as well as tackling unemployment in the short term, there is still, we're still making progress on things that have a payoff in the longer term. So, for example, like investment in early years, uh, in, uh, early years education, for example. Then, then on infrastructure, you know, that's very much been the, the centrepiece of the levelling up agenda pre-crisis. There's a clear intention uh, from everything the PM and the Chancellor have said to double down on that, which I think is right. Again, the, the challenge here will be on delivery, how much you can deliver in the short term. Important, not just for political reasons, but actually because you know, increasing capital spending in the next two years is a big part of the overall economic recovery uh, package. So I think there's a really big challenge to break down the barriers to getting shovel-ready capital out of the door, whether that is planning restrictions or, or local authority capacity, uh, for example. So that's, that's a pretty whistle-stop uh, tour of the uh, politics. I think that the kind of main takeaways are, you know, we need a coherent, overarching strategy to tackle regional inequality rather than piecemeal policy announcements. Uh, and, and the second is, 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 you know, we really need to get the balance right between those quick wins to meet the political demand for tangible progress by the next election, while putting in place the, the, the long-lasting building blocks to deliver the permanent change Philip was talking about. Back to you, Matt. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. That's great. Um, we move on to Katie. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Katie Rose. I'm a programme manager, as Matt said, at the Centre for Public Impact. Um, we are a not-for-profit organisation that works with governments around the world to help them listen, learn and adapt better to put citizens' voices at the heart. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work in the UK around COVID to try to listen to communities and really understand how those worst affected places in the UK are feeling COVID. Um, and I think from speaking to a lot of community leaders and communities, as previous panellists have said, I mean, the virus is not affecting all parts of the UK in the same way or to the same degree. The inequalities within and across regions are going to get deeper and more polarised. And also what we've really heard is people's feelings towards government and society in those places that are worst hit is being really damaged. You know, they, they already felt unheard and underrepresented. And actually this virus is proving to be a, you know, a fresh wave of resentment towards government that I think they're going to have to deal with as part of this levelling up agenda. So what does COVID-19 and the differential effect it's having across the UK mean for the Conservative um, government's levelling up agenda? Well, I think as panellists have touched upon, on the one hand, the Conservatives' commitment to spreading prosperity across regions has never been so important. Places that are the worst hit by crisis will need that urgent and even more attention and support than maybe was previously thought. And the government has recognised this with Boris Johnson saying that the crisis is a springboard to double down on this levelling up agenda. And as Tim commented, you know, they need to make sure that they deliver at a local level for those Lent voters that Boris Johnson keeps talking about to make sure that they um, fulfil their political agenda. But I think what we've seen from talking to people and looking at other governments' responses across the world is actually what this crisis has highlighted is that a multifaceted levelling up programme that focuses on infrastructure and kind of injecting funding into various regions won't be enough. What's needed is a fundamental mindset shift in the role of national government and what it means for national government to truly support and serve local places and put people's voices at the heart. 
what we did at CPI UK when it became clear that the virus was going to affect different parts of the UK differently is we looked around the world for prominent examples of regions and communities who have responded well to significant economic downturns in the past. And we had a list of over 35 case studies and actually dove into seven case studies specifically from Sweden, from Germany, and actually even the UK in the past. And these are all published in a report that we shared after this webinar. But we categorized those case studies into the three phases of the crisis response, often using government. So fight, recover, and rebuild to be able to highlight what governments around the world have done in different stages of crisis and the practices they have used to help places cope and, and overcome crisis so that this would provide hope and inspiration for the UK government as part of their levelling up agenda. And what we saw from these case studies was really the importance of local ownership and engagement, as well as the existence of strong local leadership and legitimacy. For instance, in a South Korean case study we feature, the city of Busan, after being hit hard by the financial crisis, was given the autonomy to set its own regional innovation plan. And they were given a, a pot of money from the central government that didn't come with an itemized list on spending, but the local city was, it was able to use its local networks and use the methods they already had in place to drive an agenda they set. So I think what was really clear from the case studies that we looked at was how important this local direction setting and local action really was. And in all cases, far from being accidental or one-off initiatives, national government and the civil service in those, in those national governments played a pivotal role in creating the conditions for successful local transformation. In each of the cases we looked at, local actors were given the power, the ownership and the budget to drive progress. So for instance, another case study we looked at was the city of Newcastle in response to the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. And the Newcastle City Council were given the autonomy to create a 10 point action plan where they set their own agenda for where they wanted to, to spend money and existing power structures that already existed and administrative structures they had already built were given the power to drive progress. So nothing new was imposed on them from national government. They were enabled to actually do what they felt was best in existing structures that already existed at a local level and use the relationships that already existed at a local level. And actually in the Newcastle case, the central government played a really interesting role by being a connector for the city between a wider network of EU cities that were doing similar strategies. And that's actually a key role that the national government can play there. But actually, a lot of the time they left Newcastle City Council to do what they felt was best and guided them with international examples. So what we saw from places like the Newcastle case I just talked about was not a programme or a set of policies directed from central government, but was a fundamental shift in power from national government to the local level. There was a drive from national government to really understand the potential of a place through local eyes and help the local people build on it, to ignite local missions that mobilise people and actors across multiple sectors, and an empowerment of existing trusted leadership and structures. There's so much good stuff already going on in the UK at a local level, which I'm sure I don't need to tell people about. But as part of what the work we've been doing at CPI UK, we've been listening to a lot of these community leaders during the crisis. And what we've heard back is the sense of community has been really built upon. And there's so much power and relationships in communities and at a local level right now that the national government really needs to find a way as part of this levelling up agenda to light a fire under. So I think for me, the, the government's levelling up agenda, if it, if it really needs and wants to help people and places that need it as a response to this crisis over the long term, I think they need, they, they need to think about this priority differently and actually shift their mindset. It's not so much about levelling up as that implies pulling a lever or raising up by a central godlike hand, but it's actually fundamentally about enabling and having a focus on actually letting go more than doing anything else. National governments need to try to solve for not being another thing that local actors need to navigate that curbs both enthusiasm and potential. Their role has to be one of coordination, enablement and acceleration, not control management and the putting up of restrictions or regulations that actually often slows down local actors or gets them to toe a line or an agenda set by Whitehall. 
So to, to finish, I mean, national government, I think they need to let go of power and focus all their energy on thinking about how to fundamentally redistribute and change the structure of the power so that it gets closest to the people that need it in these places in order to fulfill levelling up over the long term. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much indeed, Katie. Um, we are getting a fair amount of consensus. I, I can't imagine Chris Murray is going to challenge this, uh, this but I bet you've got some interesting stuff to say, Chris. Uh, sadly, Matt, I, I agree with a lot of, uh, of, of the above, uh, if not all. So <clears throat> here's a slide on how not to do levelling up. Uh, this is what we've done for the last 40 years. And uh, this, this slide shows all the available economic data for all the core cities compared to London, compared to uh, GB. And you can see if you go back to uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s, core cities uh, were doing better than London. You know, we forget that actually London uh, really struggled. It had a tough time. And then over successive economic shocks, uh, it's overtaken uh, core cities and then the uh, GB uh, average and core cities have got got knocked further and further uh, back and each of these dips is a, a, a major economic shock and the reason for that is that after um, uh, deindustrialization the core cities lost a lot of the things that made them resilient to shocks and able to recover quickly and London managed to build those things into its economic uh, ecosystem and th those things are fairly complex but two that I would pull out as being really major are the levels of skills in the local labour market and the kind of infrastructure that you've got uh, it, within the, the, the city region and clearly those are, uh, have become a lot better and a lot higher uh, in London than they have um, in, in other places. And that's certainly not, those certainly not kind of anti-London comments, you know, we need to, uh, London to do well, but there's no reason why the other cities shouldn't and couldn't do well uh, either. So we brought the OECD in to look at this last year to have a kind of refresh uh, and just say from a very uh, objective evidence-based perspective what underlies these issues of low productivity in big cities outside of uh, the southeast. So they said a couple of things. The first was that it is clearly linked to um, over-centralisation in the UK. Now, we, we know that, a lot of us know that, but for the OECD to come in and say that is quite extraordinary, you know, given that uh, particularly the UK government is a member of the OECD. So they came right out and said that. Um, the second thing they said is that within functioning economic areas, we need to do more to recognise in policy the links between places, between towns and cities and outlying uh, rural areas. And policies tended to focus on one or the other. I think that's one of the dangers of the uh, the left behind leveling up agenda is that it sees places that I don't particularly like that language, but let's let's use it uh, that are left behind as economic islands, you know, and you just sort of invest in that place, put your policy into that place and it'll be OK. And th th they are they absolutely are not places are linked. And this was a problem with some of the regional policy uh, of the of the past that Philip uh, 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 took us through so well. That it ended up not distinguishing between the different roles that places have uh, within their economic ecosystems and uh, so you know where are the drivers of growth and how do you leverage those and how do you connect them to not through trickle down but through uh, sensible economic policy to places that need to do better <clears throat> it, you know it used to be called spreading the jam basically to keep everyone happy and there's, to an extent that's happened in Scotland and Wales as well. So devolution to, <clears throat> excuse me, Scotland and Wales certainly has not been uh, devolution to the cities or city regions uh, in those places. The third thing the OECD said was that we need to do more to link social and economic policy that would actually those have drifted apart. So and, and that's been really exposed, I think, by COVID, the connections between <clears throat> excuse me, health policy uh, and economic policy have been absolutely laid bare, for example. Um, this is really important for productivity because in, just in the core cities, we know that 40% of low productivity on average is linked to deprivation. So if we're not dealing with that, we're not dealing with underlying 
health issues that bring people into the labour market, that productivity is, all, productivity is always going to remain low, no matter what we do about infrastructure and, and so on. And they also said, you've got to invest more in infrastructure and labour market and skills and those, those things that are the core of economic strength um, in, in localities. So that, that sort of sounds like a plan for where we are now as well, actually. And we're bringing OECD back to, to, to refresh that work, but there's nothing there that wouldn't actually aid the situation that we're trying uh, to deal with now. And of course, there need to be national measures alongside that as well. I think that we should accept the recommendations of a national infrastructure assessment and get on and invest in that, use stimulus funding to get those projects up and running. They are eminently sensible and will create jobs and will help us to adapt to the economic shifts that have been accelerated. Uh, the devolution white paper, I think, is critical in this UK Share Prosperity Fund uh, is another resource, and that's something that we could, there are means and ways of bringing that forward. And a patient equity fund that people like uh, Jim, uh, Jim O'Neill have been talking about to help business recapitalise. So it's those sort of national measures alongside local ones that will help us with all of this and that ultimately will help us to level up. So the final point is that it, within, within this, you know, I think that the there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of kind of flighty thinking about the future uh, post C19. And I would say that within that, the, you know, to misquote uh, Mark Twain, the, the death of cities is much exaggerated. You know, they're not, they're not going to go away. We're not, the, the 55 million urban population of the UK is not suddenly going, going to go and live in a load of villages because what are villages where 55 million people live called their cities. So, you know, but what we value about cities will, it is changing and what we'll demand from them in the future will change as well, cities and towns. Part of that has got to be about addressing the issues that, that we've all set out and that I've uh, just tried to summarise there. But I think there are issues about quality, quality of space and life and, and environment in cities that will be fundamental to levelling up as well. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, we're remarkably close to running on time. It's a miracle. Right? Thank you all so, so much for that. We, Nicola, we, uh, yourself last Don't worry, I'm sure I'll knacker the timing as much as anything else. No, don't, we've got loads of questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, lovely to be uh, in such an august company. I love anyone that can survive a civil service for longer than I do, which was one year. Um, the North Star leads the way to the mountaintop in awe, which is why my friends, they say, up, up, up north, was the poem that Len Sisse opened the convention, the first convention of the North, uh, two years ago. I think, um, essentially, the, the contributions have been fantastically com complementary. So I'm going to seek to kind of pull a bit of that together. I should say, firstly, something about me, having said I was a civil servant for a year, I've been doing regional policy analysis, mainly from within academia for 20 years. And maybe I've been in my house too long, but I've been thinking more and more about poetry and about how poetry links to policy in this uh, lockdown. All right, uh, I'll just say one more thing about that, which is it's the same way as you read a poem, there's like, you know, there's the more active word in a sentence, and it's exactly the same in policy, right? So the sort of hashtag diplomacy that we see around hashtag Northern Powerhouse, hashtag Northern Shithouse, hashtag whatever, is very similar to the kind of driving metaphor or image within poetry. Um, and we need to, we need, so uh, in a sense, Philip talked about the kind of organisational machinery of government challenge, Tim about the kind of raw politics of, re of the regions, Katie's kind of, you know, opportunities for hope and her description of Newcastle, a city I know incredibly well since where my dad's from. And I've watched that city, by the way, regenerate over my lifetime, over 40 years. So the first point is, never let people tell you that places can't change radically, because when you look over a lifetime, Newcastle, the, you know, that the absolutely sensational quayside, that was 
I, I don't dispute the narrative that Katie explained about localism, but there was a huge central government policy, UDCs, et cetera, et cetera, which laid the foundations for Newcastle's resurgence uh, through you know, in the 80s, et cetera. Liverpool, another city I know incredibly well, having worked for four years in the Heseltine Institute for Policy and Practice. Another, I just throw this at you. I went to the launch of a the kind of digital business that we all go completely wild about, CGI, big, big London company, do everything, cyber security, all that stuff. Taken the second floor suite in the Albert Dock and they had all their money men up and all the rest of it. They bought 700 jobs to the north over the last couple of years. And this is an advert for them, by the way. And they, their board couldn't believe it. As in, this looks like a boutique hotel. This looks like Malmaison. And this is where our programmers are gonna sit. This is unbelievable. And if you know the Albert Dock, and if you know that the, the waves of policy that dredged it, that built it up, that regenerated it, that put it as heritage, that did the World Heritage stuff, uh, and I've seen some good shit in the chat, he knows this story much better than I do. But to the point where last year you can go to a launch where 700 quality jobs are emanating out of that amazing um, floor full of... Um, yeah, I mean, it is. It's all bricky and shoreditchy and gorgeous. And they couldn't believe what they were paying for it because, let's face it, the North is cheap. The other thing I wanted to say, apart from noodling on about poetry, Chris is absolutely right. You need all the graphs and charts and figures, but that's kind of, in a sense, it's not really work. That hasn't worked, right? So I'm always doing this. So the great um, Professor Brian Robson, who set up the Centre for Urban Policy Studies at Manchester, who very sadly is not with us anymore, died last week, week before. He was, he, 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 he was a statistician, but a social statistician. And I, that's where I did my PhD and I was very influenced by Brian and his, his influence over policy actually in the eighties and so on. But having done poetry and, and Brian, there is something about how we view um, the things as a spectrum. So Tim talked about a kind of quite pork barrel, quite transactional thing. So I would argue that in the Osborne, so Osborne, despite being known as an austerity chancellor, she's incredibly generous, just, to, just not to local government, right? So there was a sweet spot when Jim O'Neill, who's been mentioned, was in the treasury, and they, they were doing all sorts of stuff. I mean, if you look at the ring around Cambridge, the knowledge intensive stuff that they did with David Willits down there, completely transforming that space and place around a knowledge and sensitivity. Um, you know, the, uh, the Tatton Osborne Memorial Ring Road to the airport, you know, the, 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 a lot of things happened in a George Osborne, but they were one at a timing. Now, if you have like a spectrum between pork barrel one at a timing and a kind of comprehensive spatial planning process at the other side, we are yet to see where this government in this iteration with this, these Secretary of State, this configuration, end up kind of emotionally or ideologically and again emotion very important that's why you come back to poetry again it's a spectrum between you know straight pork barrel to to a comprehensive plan now pork barrel gets people much more excited you know i know i'm a planner chris the oecd stuff is fabulous but it just never cuts through to make people feel differently about their place um and so yes, in so, so and in the context of the virus, um, like please nobody nobody be sick down themselves. But you know, six white people on the screen. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about intersectionality because the virus is like a trump card over the intersections of race and class and region and poverty and ill health that combine to create deprivation. So multiple deprivation, we know this is you know, policy responses around that, but the virus serves to just overlay on all of that and risks as described, going to the points of extreme vulnerability, right? So, so um, Tim's right, there is visitor economy everywhere, but when you look at the center for cities data, the way that, so, so the spatial distribution of disadvantage and inequality is a spectrum for everything. And then when you start to range those things into a, you know, it's starting to sound like Dominic Cummings and his super forecasters, right? You, you're looking at multiply complicated causes and effects. I would argue, and maybe this is an area of dissension, 
I've been trying it for 20 years, Chris, as you very well know. You wave the OECD graph in somebody's face, you take Ron Martin's stats out, you know, that hasn't created the change that we need. Something else needs to be in this mix. And again, in terms of sociology, poetry, um, it is about that heart stuff, you know, it is about, so uh, again, as, as well as not, not being written down as the biggest austerity, you know, the, the most um, gen uh, generous chancellor, um, George Osborne, Jake Berry, the minister for two years, doesn't get enough credit because he managed, so Vishy said this week, that it's a fantastic brand. You're absolutely right, Tim. He gave Northern Swing voters enough to believe that they could erase their kind of intergenerational nervousness about voting Tory because they're doing the Northern powerhouse and they kept up a drumbeat of announcements and, uh, and, and, and things. And again, hashtag diplomacy, very public facing policy development as rapid as from idea to out into the media with no uh, implementation chain planned. But that is the place where people vote from. There's something between the economic, social, psychological, aesthetic, identity-based that all comes together into leadership. So I'm sorry, was that just like a 20 minute rant? I'll stop. Something in the heart department, rather than a machinery of government change, rather than a policy program, fiscal event, kill me now. Just as I'm coming to my point, my husband walks in. There's, there's, a, there's a heart piece. And without that, we're not gonna understand it and we're not gonna be able to fix it, even with the best one in the world. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, yeah, really interesting. It was really good to have, um, all, you know, although there's quite a lot of agreement, um, a lot of different perspectives, um, we've got a number of questions, but I just wanna ask, um, uh, well, one obvious one is, I mean, there has been, um, you know, some concern that, that COVID hits, for example, the North Midlands worse than other areas. But on other levels, you could, there's ways in which actually um, it might hit London more. Um, I just wanted to do people have a view on, are there any sort of particular challenges or harms created by COVID for the areas we're trying to, we're trying to level up? And, are, are any of the outcomes of COVID potentially, could they assist? Could they provide a relative advantage for these areas? Um, I mean, I'll just trot through it because you need to give a brief answer, but I'll just do it in the same order then. So, Philip, you and views on that one. Uh, I think I'm a bit with Tim on this. I think it's, it's really difficult to tell what the, the medium long term impacts uh, economically of, of the COVID crisis will be. What I can say is that the the UK, pretty much uniquely in the world, has another self-imposed economic transition point to cross in the not too distant future, um, which will have a very big impact on a bunch of sectors that haven't necessarily been hard hit by COVID. So if you put those two things together, you've got COVID hitting hospitality, leisure, tourism, you've got Brexit coming down the track, which is going to impact more on um, on, on businesses that are uh, trading with, uh, with, with the EU, um, integrated supply chains, all the rest of that, in other words, manufacturing, um, which is more concentrated in the Midlands and the north of England, as well as parts of Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. So I think the, this is a, a combination of challenges um, that is, is, is unique, um, is unprecedented, use a much overused word, uh, word and which the government is going to have to think very, very hard about how to address. I, I, but I think it's too early to say how the particular mix in COVID will sort of work through all of that. But what we can say, I think now, is that over the course of the next 24 months or so, um, the UK economy is going to go through a pretty significant adjustment, which will impact on all sectors and all parts of the UK. It's not a very positive message, I'm afraid, um, on a Wednesday morning, but that's the reality uh, that we're looking at. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, Tim, do you have any thoughts on differential impact of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the one thing we've just got to be careful about is, is kind of confirmation bias and to kind of look for evidence that says this is going to reinforce existing regional inequalities, because I think this is an important agenda and, and I think people don't want 
lot, lots of people won't want to move off it. But, but I, I do think we just have to wait and see what, what, what the data looks like. And particularly, as I say, once the job retention scheme unwinds, that's when you'll start to really understand which areas are, are going to be the hardest hit. But, but I do think the counter to the existing narrative, I think London probably has some fairly unique challenges, um, particularly you know, in this interim period before we hopefully find a long-term exit, exit from, the, from, from COVID through a vaccine. The, vast, you know, com, com, the, the, the number of the proportion of Londoners and people in the Southeast who commute using public transport compared to the rest of the country, I think that has a potentially, and, and, and the knock-on effects of therefore people working from home much more on all those businesses that support central London office space. I think, I think London is going, to have a, uh, is going to have a particular set of challenges um, 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 c- coming out of the crisis. So we'll obviously be, we need to be alive to those too. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it occurred to me that, um, you know, so many um, highly skilled or well-paid jobs are, are sort of connected currently to London and the South East and that everybody is now working from home I mean, we see it in government departments where, you know, ministers always used to require the agency chief to come in front of them, otherwise they just lose influence. But actually nowadays they're happy to do it on a video conference. And um, we might see a shift, which means that you could hold really highly skilled technical professional jobs, do them remotely, and that would free people to move out of London and South East um, and obviously spend their money locally. So I can can imagine ways in which um, I would say this... Um, this thing has yeah, mixed impact at least. Um, Katie, do you have any uh, thoughts on, on this? Yeah, I'll just add uh, one thought, which is I think, so I agree that we don't know what the medium and long term impacts are of this, but I think what we need to do is listen to what people are saying already and find ways to listen really deeply to what people are saying at the community level. Um, because I do think there's a real danger that this crisis could actually further alienate people from government and the society um, that ultimately we need to try to work together to improve. So that's one point. And then I think just on, on your point of whether this could actually assist places to give them the opportunity to, um, you know, be, be better places to live and better places for people. I think it comes back to, again, we've done a lot of work with social workers um, in lots of different communities and they're saying to us that loads of local organizations are actually doing amazing things for for people and there's so much good stuff is happening and i think there's a real worry if the government doesn't try to adapt from this but just tries to go back and forget it ever happened and we go back to doing everything like we did before i think there's a real danger that we'll miss so much the good stuff that is happening at a local level that connections and relationships that have been built as part of this as we get through this together that I think is, it will be a real miss and actually it ultimately won't produce sustainable change unless we listen to people and try to try to listen to that change that's already happening. Thanks. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> I am sort of, uh, I, I hope for change, but remain uh, a little sceptical uh, that, that, you know, generally after uh, um, well, not things like this. We haven't been in this position before. But the, you know, major crises has kind of returned to form uh, in terms of behaviours and, and structures, and uh, particularly around around power and, and resource. So I, I do think, without a really major push, without a very very strong focus, that that is likely uh, to be the same. Some of those shifts have to be about economic adaptation, you know, digital uh, green recovery, and so on. Talked about very much support that. In terms of the impacts, I think some of the, some of that information is already, you know, I think it's not too much of a leap to draw uh, a connection between what the health impacts have been and where the economic ones will be. And the ONS figures are very, very clear on that, that the health impacts are twice as bad in big urban areas as non-urban and they're much, much worse for deprived than uh, non-deprived, more affluent communities. So I think, you know, absolutely agree with the point about uh, bias and you know the evidence will continue to come out but I, it would be a miracle uh, if this uh, if the economic impact doesn't follow uh, that pattern that's a, that's a, that's an issue for every place that has deprivation and frankly that is most of uh, the UK in one way or another but we do know it's concentrated in certain places 
so I do I do think there needs to be a massive push from all it's you know it's uh, uh, beholden on all of us to really push to try and get that that political focus on on recovery to uh, to continue and just one final point is that just sort of pick it picks up in a different way what Nicola's saying is that this is it's a health crisis and it's an economic crisis but it's also a psychological crisis you know we've all been through some people far worse than others a major psychological event here and that requires a psychological uh, response as well that is something that we, we should take very seriously Sorry, thank you. Uh, and Nicola, you, you mentioned the sort of, you know, the intersectional, the, 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 the risk to, to people, uh, vulnerable groups, one way or another, and it's layering up. Is there, is there any, any flip side to that? Is there any, could COVID, you know, help in any ways? Um, so, okay, so I'm, I'm going to shut up about poets and intersectionality and I'm just going to talk about what data we do have. So I can do the two things that keep me awake at night are as follows. Number one, for the northern economy, so the 15 million, the 11 LEP area of the northern powerhouse, 1.8 in 10 workers will not end the year in the job they were in at the beginning of the year. So 18% of people are going to churn through either the absolutely wonderful universal credit system for the first time and really see the effects of a public service reform agenda, or they're going to set up in business or they're going to find another job and reducing the transaction cost of getting that 1.8 people down is the biggest public policy challenge of our lifetimes right so that's just we're in the waiting room for a very good reason that's right tim and philip are absolutely right we're in the waiting room because the stimulus the various strands of the stimulus the corona job retention scheme furlough the sibbles the bibbles the bubbles whatever the you know all the things but whereas the 2008 unpleasantness, we never dipped below minus 2% of GDP. Cambridge Econometrics, known to many of us who do very, very good work on this, say that without stimulus, the recession would have been a minus 5.8% recession, so three times as bad as 2008. But with the stimulus, they're prepared to concede that that's taken 0.6 off the worst case scenario. So a minus 5.2 recession is what we need to prepare for. So it's better not to call it a recession. You've got to call it a slump because, uh, and as again, as Philip very um, ably pointed out, we've got uh, the ABC are still there. Austerity, Brexit, COVID. None of these are good things. Well, Brexit, arguably marvellous. But as everybody says, in terms of restructuring, a plus B plus C equals mass failure of businesses. And I've seen data on insolvencies, which again, as it starts to you know, unwind, as Tim says, but you know, every business lost, that's insomnia, depression, divorce, you know, foreclosure, all those lovely, you know, as that winds out, that is people having the worst year of their life, irrespective. And we will look, and so the polling data suggests that 87% of people don't think that they will lose their job, but 18% will. So how does that, all these things are not connected. And as I say, but the two things, the, the minus 5.2 L shaped recession, I completely buy from the data and 1.8 in 10 needing to churn into employment. And poetry and leadership and stars and all the rest of it. Um, we have six minutes. There's one point I want to just cover. I think we can cover this one quite briefly in a couple of sentences, really. It's kind of, I, well, people have talked about the need to empower the local, but actually the thing needs driving, strategy, coordination at the centre. You need monitoring of, uh, you know, you need to set out what the goals are and then monitor delivery against them. We need to get find leverage to get the departments to act on it. So... How do you think, you know, what should be the mechanism by which this thing is driven and led at the centre of government? Uh, Philip? Well, inevitably, my sort of agenda is for deeper, longer term change. That's not going to happen overnight. I absolutely recognise that. And you do need central government uh, uh, 
for want of anything else at the moment to, to get a grip on this agenda, as everybody in different ways has said. Um, the, the coordination in Whitehall, um, you know, lots of different ways of doing it, um, and not for me to specify what sort of cabinet committees you put in place or the rest of it, but it does need hard driving uh, actually from the central government to get departments to fall into line behind a central agenda. And that's what we're going to have to see happen, it seems to me, over the next few months, um, because there isn't time, uh, never mind the political will, to have a more thoroughgoing shift in the way that we think about the governance of, of England and indeed the wider UK. Um, so I think it is a, it's a big challenge um, for the Johnson government. I'm rather pleased in a way, I don't know whether Tim would, would uh, agree with this, but to see that the Treasury has recovered some of its, its, um, uh, its influence through the COVID crisis, I think it, it has done some extraordinary things. Uh, it's been a, it has been a bright spot of the government's response, getting that money back into the economy so quickly. Um, and the Treasury thinking about this strategically, um, but given permission um, to spend uh, decent money, uh, but making sure the policies are aligned across transport, the business department, and increasingly folded in, as Chris has pointed out, also uh, the health and education side of things as well. But ultimately, if you don't do this with uh, proper engagement um, of the local actors, what you'll get will only be skin deep. It won't, it won't be sustainable over time. It'll be a little bit like you can get Albert Docks built, um, but they stand out, if you like, as a little bit of a, uh, a diamond in, a, in, a, in, a, in another way, in otherwise, fa uh, otherwise fairly grim environment. Um, so the local engagement, I think, is critical to this. Thank you. Uh, Tim, do you know, well, how, how should you drive it at the centre? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I mean, I'll t touch on the, on the importance of the treasury, which you know, I think um, I, I agree with Philip. I think the treasury has had a good crisis. Um, the difficult bit, obviously, comes next for the treasury um, when they have to withdraw these schemes and ultimately, once the economy is recovered, start to do some form of fiscal consolidation, which I think is inevitable. Um, but I think having treasury buy into this is absolutely vital. And if and if you look at the industrial strategy, for example, under the previous government. There was some treasury scepticism about that and that made the delivery of that um, uh, kind of area di uh, difficult. I think there is a lot of treasury buy into this agenda at the moment, but it is also going to require departments not just to come with shopping lists of, of their pet projects that they want delivered, right? They need to come up with coherent packages. They, they need to have lots of non-fiscal measures and there are lots of non-fiscal measures that, that, are, that are vital to this uh, uh, agenda. So I think you know, yes, the, the Treasury is going to have to spend some money and it is going to have to um, uh, um, uh, uh, accept that. But it is also, it can't just be seen, as we've said before, about just pork barrel politics. This needs to be part of a kind of coherent whole and, 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 uh, and departments not just using it to try and get cash out of the Treasury, basically. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. We are we're only like a two minutes out, so I'm actually going to swap, swap, swap questions. Um, we have had a couple of questions, one around green recovery, um, that's from Anna Bond. Anna, we will address that in the infrastructure session, which is the third session. So um, if you're not able to attend at the time, just listen back to that one. Um, I, the other questions we'll address in writing, I think, because I just want to ask the, the other three panellists. I mean, look, this whole thing, it's quite an, uh, quite an ask. We're all saying that there's a fairly fundamental shift required on the part of government if we're going to achieve this. It's going to be very expensive. We require a lot of effort reform. What's the, what's, the, what's the alternative? What's the counterfactual? What will the consequences be if we fail on this agenda of levelling up and making a real difference here? Um, and I would go to Katie. Thanks, Matt. I think if we fail, government's legitimacy will be really, really damaged. I think people will, all those lent voters that think that, that actually they can, that local change can be driven in, in their place will be proved wrong. And I think the Tory party will suffer from that. But I also think people 
and Nicola touched on this, I think those inequalities that we've already seen that COVID is affecting right now and making worse will just get so much worse and then we'll see so much more hostility and tension in society that will ultimately direct towards so many other government programmes that they want to get done. So I think ultimately if we don't get this right, I think it will severely affect government's legitimacy to deliver anything going forward. I think it should be top priority and I agree with all the stuff said about the Treasury. I mean right now I don't think they have a departmental objective to level up. I think their, you know, their roles is to reduce the structural deficit and drive productivity and investment in infrastructure and so I think it needs to be a departmental priority for all departments and they need to work out what role they can play to best serve and support local places. Yeah thank you. Um, I'm creeping into break time but nonetheless uh, Chris uh, 20 seconds on what happens if we don't get this right. Well, I think the points that were made were spot on. Uh, we're already losing before C19, 100 billion a year just from having the 11 core cities below uh, the national economic average. And, you know, sounds like a lot of money. It's not a lot of percentage points. So bringing them up to that level would, you know, absolutely put that amount of money into the economy. In terms of how we get there, You've got to let the people who are going to deliver the policies design them if they're going to work. And we've just got a very bad history of doing that. So you know, in terms of our current response, that's, that's what we've got to do. It can't just be uh, driven by, um, e even if policy is devolved, uh, nationally made solutions. They've got to be jointly made. Thank you. And uh, Nicola, please, please. please. You're mute. So I just think the, the final word, so levelling up, um, you know, there's been endless soul searching forever about whether equality of outcome or equality of opportunity are desirable policy objectives. And we've got to neither in this country, we've got widening inequality. Now, levelling up would suggest that, you know, it's either the rising tide lifts all boats or you know, it's whatever it's sort of metaphor you want to get into. Some people see levelling up far more as, a level, as you go up a level on a panel game. So just be aware, maybe we're not going to see the, um, the, the equality of outcome that, that it, might, um, it might mean to some people. And I just think the last thing I would say, stripey is bad, stripey is always bad. If you, if you take both in terms of you slice and dice policy across space and across departments, and the thing becomes ungovernable through complexity. And uh, if we don't do anything about it, it's Mad Max out there. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for that. Um, thank you to a whole, all of our panel, to Knowledge Partner Centre for Public Impact, to all of you for watching. We will return in a mere 12 minutes. Um, and uh, if you can't attend the other sessions, we will be sending you the recording and a report on each of them. Thank you, everybody, once again. Thank you. Bye-bye.